and of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> this week, I had the great joy of accompanying uh, many of my, my colleagues for the uh, uh, clergy conference, which happens in this diocese every other year. We take three days off from a very hectic time right after Easter when we're all trying to get stuff done before the Easter, before the, sorry, the summer break settles in. And uh, we took three days off and we went to Brock University and we heard a series of lectures that were given by a uh, bishop from England, Stephen Cottrell, and uh, as well as some talks given by some other people. And then we had uh, lots of worship, I mean lots of worship, and of course also social time. Now, you cannot imagine, perhaps, a more diverse group than the clergy of the Diocese of Toronto. You have young, you have old, you have the newly ordained, you have the grizzled veterans. You have the whole spectrum of people, about 250 people gathered in one place at one time to talk about their common ministry and passion. And there were, during the break times, plenty of discussions and debates. I imagine that some people would think that clergy are really sick of talking about church and that when we're together in a group, we just want to like complain and drink heavily. But in fact, uh, it's a time when we intensely debate the issues of the church and we discuss with great joyfulness all the different ideas that we have and the things that we're trying and we, we share with each other the energy and things that give us passion. It's actually a time of great renewal, great passion, and a lot of fun. One of the things that we might notice in this is that within that diversity of, of clergy that gather, we see uh, something about the Pentecost, that, that something about the way in which each of those individual people with their individual stories has their own witness to the glory of God. You see, this story that we have in Pentecost is in many ways a reversal of what happened in the Tower of Babel. You might recall in the story in the Tower of Babel, uh, humanity was all speaking one language. And from that speaking of one language, they grew so prideful that they attempted to build a tower reaching up to the heights of heaven. And they built this tower, and God said, ooh, this isn't good, <laughs> and decided to dash the tower. And when that happened, all the languages and the diversity of tongues uh, began on the earth so that people could not understand each other, and so they could never again reach to the prideful heights of building a tower to heaven. In the Pentecost story, we have a reversal of that, sort of. You'll notice, though, that tongues remain different. It's not that in Pentecost happens, everyone suddenly speaks the same language, a, a spiritual version of Esperanto, a kind of universal language. No, no, they still speak in their own tongues, in their own languages, but now they understand each other. But this isn't just an opportunity for the Medes to say how great the Medes are, or for the, uh, the Coptic-speaking Egyptians to how, say how great the Coptic-speaking Egyptians are, as we might do now when we try to validate all our cultures as being special and unique in and of themselves. No, no, this has an end. This has a purpose. It says in the text, In our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. About God's deeds of power. The first thing that's spoken when this gift of understanding is given to Peter is the sermon in which the glory of God in Jesus Christ is proclaimed. That's the purpose of the gifts. You notice in Corinthians, when uh, Paul is talking about all the different gifts that are given to individuals in the, in the communion of saints through the Holy Spirit, he talks about uh, how they're given for a purpose. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, all are members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We were all made to drink of the one Spirit. For to each, skipping, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And what greater good could there be than this to declare what God has done in Christ? And in declaring that, we enter into that great communion of saints and take into ourselves that power of the Holy Spirit. For it says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? No one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That means every time you proclaim Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Do you feel it? Do you feel the powerful gifts that God gives you in the Holy Spirit? The power to teach, the power to heal, the power to understand spirits, the power to speak in tongues or to interpret them. All these powers are in you right now. And they may feel like very small little embers, just glowing little bits of fuel, but if you blow on them and you nurture them, they can grow and grow. But remember always that they are given for the common good, to bring us together with Christ 
and the great unity that God hopes for us, that we would join him. Perhaps no greater sign of the power of the Holy Spirit to bring unity to God's people, much stronger even than the clergy conference, would be this gathering. The fact that this group of people, of 30 or 40 people or whatever, can gather on a Sunday morning from such different places. We have the young. We have the old. We have teachers. We have scientists. We have, we have yoga teachers. We have uh, artists. We have people of incredibly diverse gifts that gather in this one place with such different backgrounds. They come from such different places, and they gather here for some weird reason. What weird reason brings us together to encounter Christ together? Another great sign of the unity that we have in God is the altar and the sacrament that we celebrate here every week of communion when we all share the one bread and the one cup. Think of what an extraordinary ritual that is, not just because we're doing it together as a, as a, a motley crew, but that people around the world join us in doing that. And I mean around the world. At this very moment, the word is being spoken about, being taught about. At this very moment, people are breaking the bread. They're giving it. They're receiving it. In every permutation of human condition that you could imagine. I'm going to end with a wonderful quote. That's, uh, you may have heard it before. It's a famous one, but written by uh, Dom Gregory Dix, who's a theologian and, and liturgical scholar. He wrote this amazing paragraph about what we're about when we talk about the unity we experience in God through communion. Was ever another command so obeyed? For century after century, spreading slowly to every continent and country and among every race on earth, this action has been done. In every conceivable human circumstance, for every conceivable human need, from infancy to before it, to extreme old age and after it, from the pinnacle of earthly greatness to the refuge of fugitives in the caves and dens of the earth. Men have found no better thing than this to do for kings at their crowning and criminals going to the scaffold, for armies in triumph or for a bride and bridegroom in a little country church, for the proclamation of a dogma or for the good crop of wheat, for the wisdom of the parliament of a mighty nation or for a sick old woman afraid to die, for a schoolboy sitting from an examination or for Columbus setting out to discover America, for the famine of whole provinces, or for the soul of a dead lover, in thankfulness because my father did not die of pneumonia, for a village headman much tempted to return to Fitch because the yams have failed, because the Turk was at the gates of Vienna, for the repentance of Margaret, for the settlement of a strike, for the son of a barren woman, for Captain so-and-so wounded and prisoner of war, while the lions roared in a nearby amphitheater, on the beach at Dunkirk, while the hiss of sighs in the thick June grass came faintly through the windows of a church, tremulously, by an old monk, on the 50th anniversary of his vows, furtively, by an exiled bishop who had hewn timber all day in a prison camp near Murmansk, gorgeously, for the coronation of St. Joan of Arc, one could fill many pages for the reasons why men have done this and not tell a hundred part of them. And best of all, week by week and month by month, on a hundred thousand successive Sundays, faithfully, unfailingly, across all parishes of Christendom, the pastors have done this just to make the pleb sancta Dei, that is, the holy common people of God. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. It would not be enough to declare the glory of God that we have in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen.